Welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast, where real life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm thrilled to bring you this episode today. I recently did an interview with John Burke, and one of the people that he mentions in the interview is Heidi Barr. And even a few of you have even reached out to me to want to know where they can find her testimony. Well, as I told you, she was coming on. So today I have her on my show. And uh, Heidi lives out in the beautiful West. And she was, um, she has uh, several miracles that have, that we're going to share today. Um, One of them is actually a healing miracle. She, it's a miracle that she's alive and she's going to share all of that. Um, But then another thing that's really beautiful and unique about her testimony is kind of her faith walk and something that happened in this trauma that she experienced where she got to go to heaven. Um, She died briefly. She met Jesus and she a whole lot more. <laughs> I'm gonna let her. Hear. <laughs> but, uh, it's really, really beautiful, and um, I'm just thrilled to have her here today. Um, she's an author. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. She's a grandmother, and um, she's just, God's using her in amazing ways. So, Heidi, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. It's really fun. It's really so, nice to be with you. Oh, thanks. And uh, I would love for you to kind of share before you go into your story, kind of your up uh, your background, like when you before the accident happened. I, before the accident happened, I was Jewish and I'm still Jewish, but I'm kind of this weird Jewish Christian mix. Yeah. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family, which is odd because we were part of an Orthodox community, but my father's an atheist and my mother's an agnostic. And we were taught from a very, although I had an amazing Orthodox Jewish education, we were taught kind of indoctrinated from a very young age that and and this is not intended to offend any of your listeners but this is my father's this is what my father lives by and he is he's still alive and he is an atheist to this day he told us from the time we were small children that jesus christ was the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind that paul saint paul was the biggest anti-semite who ever lived that christians are not stupid, but naive for having hope that there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no hope of reward, there is no fear of punishment. Um, One of his favorite things that he talked about all the time was he would talk to each of us and and he would even pontificate at the, the meal, at our meals that we are less significant than the tiniest microscopic speck of dust in the universe. There's, there's no meaning to our life that we are an accident of science, oh my accident of physics. That's not something you'll see on a Hallmark, Hallmark card. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was really, it was, it was hard growing up because at the same time that in the Orthodox community, there was a belief in God mm-hmm. at home. There was no recognition that God existed. God did not exist in our household. And my youngest sister and I used to have nightmares. We would both have the same nightmare being buried alive and then being aware that we were being buried alive. So it was not, it was not when you're, when you're a little kid, that's not what you want to hear when your dog dies or your grandpa dies. It's not what you want to hear. Um, I was a little bit different in that I always had a sense that there was a God. I believed in God. I couldn't put my finger on it, but from the, as long, for as long as I can remember from the time I was in a big girl bed, I would talk to God every night. I would talk to him, tell him what had happened that day, ask him, um, why are we here? What is the meaning of life? I would talk to God and I had a sense that he was sitting next to me. I didn't see him. I just had the sense that he was sitting next to me and I'm talking about God. I'm not talking about Jesus 
because in my mind, Christianity was an entirely separate religion. And according to my father, Jesus was an idol and Christians were idol worshipers. So I didn't have a thought that, oh, I'm, I'm talking to Jesus. I just felt I was talking to God. And uh, that's the religious background I came from. I, I'm really well, well versed in Judaism. And I've done a lot of study, uh, but there was no God in our household. Zip, zero, none. Um, and then, of course, additionally, I, there were a lot of family family dynamics that were not healthy. Um, and I, I was uh, hard as odd as this may seem to some people. From the age of twelve, between the ages of twelve and sixteen, I was in quite a number of not by choice sexually and physically abusive relationships, um, including the initial introduction to that with a pedophile rabbi. <laughs> so my life was a little weird. And when I, this is what I'm going to say to you. It's hard to explain. I talked to God until I was 12. When I was 12, I was subject to a lot of sexual abuse. And even though I knew God was there, I stopped talking to him. I didn't blame him. I didn't blame him. But I stopped talking to him because the shame and humiliation and horror were so deep, I couldn't talk about it. So I stopped talking to him. And I would say that over the next few years, I didn't talk to him. I spent a lot of time struggling. I was... Uh, you just, I was hanging out with a bad crowd. I was experimenting with drugs. I was doing anything I could to get away from this pain. Turning to God was not something I did at that point in life. So that's where I was. That is where I was standing when I died, except not literally. <laughs> but yes. Yes. That's where I was in my head when I had my accident. I was headed down a very self-destructive road. I was the person I was hurting the most because I was actually a really nice kid. The person I was hurting the most was me. I wasn't hurting anyone else. I was hurting myself. Oh, wow. So I'm excited for you to share this next part of all people to meet Jesus. I think this is, it's traumatic, <laughs> but it's also got a good side to it. So, okay. So it's, now. Yeah, I am the least well no there are probably a lot of people who consider themselves least likely to meet Jesus I am not I'm unlikely in my mind I would have at that moment he was not anyone I would have expected to meet I didn't know anything about him I knew the only reason I knew Jesus had been a Jew that he was Jewish was because my grandmother told me that he was Jewish I thought he was just some total other god for some total other religion that was completely divorced from Judaism wow so, and I know we got to chuckle because I was a Christian and I saw Jesus being called a Jew. So I thought I was Jewish. <laughs> Here you are Jewish, not knowing. No, it was just, it's so <laughs> funny. You knew he was Jewish. I didn't, Christians know he's Jewish. I didn't know he was Jewish. <laughs> in fact, he, we weren't allowed to talk about him in our house. You were not allowed to talk about him wow. unless somebody was, my, unless someone in the household was using him as a cuss word. You weren't, weren't allowed to talk about him. Wow. Wow. So, so I kind of. Jesus must be a cuss word. <laughs> oh, wow. So I, oh, so, okay. So let's shift into the, the next part, um, that day at the barn. I, I, I had a horse, my father, I loved horses from the time I was a little kid. My father had taken a horse and trade from a rancher. He uh, did some more legal work for, and it was for me. She's a great horse. She was four years old, um, quarter horse. I named her Heather. And normally I rode with a friend of mine, but she was sick on this day. She had a cold. So, and I just, I'd gotten my license. I was 16. It's a couple of weeks after I'd gotten my license. And honestly, I couldn't remember if it was a Sunday or a Monday, but I talked to my sister and we agreed it was a day we were off school for some reason. I'm not quite sure why it might've been around Easter. And uh, so I took my sisters out to the ranch with me. And this big green Delta, Oldsmobile Delta 88. 
my little sister was 11. My middle sister was 14. My little sister liked to play with the mini horses there. And my middle sister was allergic to horses. So she stayed in the car with the windows rolled up. When I got my horse out, I, there were, there was a couple arguing in the barn. Um, the woman owned an Arabian who was really hard to manage and the husband wanted to ride the Arabian. She didn't want the husband to ride the Arabian. And I was like, whatever, I'm just going to get my horse and leave. And I didn't have a saddle. I didn't own a saddle. I just had a bridle. So I took Heather and I rode up the hill. The, there was a barn at the bottom in a valley, the barn, the stable and the paddocks were all at the in the valley. And then there was a hill that went up behind the barn and you could ride over the hill. Charlie had, I don't remember how many acres of forest of wooded land with trails. And normally I'd be riding with my friend Cheryl, but I rode by myself and it was not a big deal. I loved riding, so I didn't care. So I, I took off and I was gone for an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. It's kind of a blustery, partly cloudy day. And I thought, well, my sisters are probably getting bored. I should head back to the barn. So I headed back on the, along the trail and as you approached the barn, you couldn't see it, but you came around a corner and beneath you, far below you was the barn. And then you had a choice. You could take the trail down to the barn or you could take a ridge trail, which ran a, kind of along the back. It was still up high. It ran along the back of the barn and, uh, and then it, it dead ended. And so I decided I'm just gonna, there's a really nice view. I have a view in both directions. So I took that trail and I stopped at the end and I was sitting there on my horse enjoying the day and I heard hoofbeats, hoofbeats behind me. Um, and I knew immediately that it was that guy. <laughs> I knew immediately that he had taken that horse out and he was out of control. So he came flying around the corner. The he dropped the reins. He was hanging onto the saddle horn for dear life. I thought his horse would go to the barn. Most of the time when horses are out of control and they're running back towards the barn, they go to the barn. So my assumption was that the horse would go to the barn. She didn't. She turned down the ridge trail. And I thought, okay, don't panic. She'll see your horse standing here calmly and she'll stop. But she didn't. She kept coming. And I didn't know what to do. I thought I could jump off Heather, but I might get trampled between the two horses. I honestly didn't know what to do. So I thought, I'm just going to stay on Heather. So she, this horse slammed into Heather. Heather reared up. The first time she reared up, I dropped the reins and grabbed her neck and she went back down um, and then she reared up again. This time when she reared up, she stepped with her back legs off the edge of the trail and flipped over down the slope, falling across my body because I was still on her. Oh. If, if I had been wearing a saddle, it probably would have ruptured my aorta and I probably would have stayed dead. But um, she fell across my body and I'll give you the physical part. She, uh, I had a broken pelvis, a broken back and a crushed chest. That's the physical part. Wow. The soul part, the God part was different. When Heather flipped over and she hit my chest, I left my body immediately. I left my body and I will tell you every cell in my body stood stock still and my soul left from every cell. And I, I rose up above my body, 30, 40 feet in the air. I looked down. I saw Heather roll over my body. I was tossed like a rag doll. I saw her slide down the slope and run to the barn. And I thought, okay, she's all right. And I saw the other guy's horse turn around and run back down the trail and take the trail to the barn. I saw my little sister cover her face with her hands and scream. I saw my other sister and I was pretty far away, but I saw my other sister put her hands against the window of the car like this and stick her face up against the window. And the odd thing was I could see into the barn. The barn door faced the other direction, but I could actually see both horses in the barn. I could see the commotion in the barn. I could see Charlie realize, oh, Heidi's not on the horse. And where's Heidi? And at that moment, as I'm sitting up there, there are two things that occurred to me. The first was that I didn't care what happened to me. My body was immaterial. It didn't matter to me. And I realized this is a shell that's built to house the soul. The shell doesn't matter. I did not care what happened to me. I had not a thought for myself. The second thing was that I, 
said to myself, I wish my sisters didn't have to see me die. And when I said that, I noticed a light over the shoulder, a golden light. And it was, even though it was a cloudy day, kind of some partly cloudy day, this golden light was bathing everything in front of me and lighting up everything in front of me. And as I noticed it, I looked and there was a person there and he moved forward. He's up in the air with me and it was Jesus. I recognized him immediately. I'm a Jewish girl. I was told he didn't exist. I was told he was a hoax. I was told he was an idol, that he was fake. And I knew right then, this is Jesus. And I knew I had, I know I'm getting exposed to you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I had known him my entire life. He was, he's, he's right here smiling at me with the, the most joyous, radiant grin and face. And I said, hi, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> and, and he, we both were laughing, but he was all at once, my father, my brother, my best friend. And I knew he'd been the one sitting at my bedside. I knew he'd been the one who had been there listening to me. There was no doubt when this is the thing I learned when you die, there's no doubt, there's no question. And there is only truth. When you die, it's like, you can't pretend, oh yeah, that's not really Jesus because it really was Jesus. Um, he's filled, his face radiates so much love that it's beyond description. So much love and so much warmth for me. And it was and just bathing me in this love and warmth and acceptance. And he, and I, everything else, uh, that I knew about Jesus, that I, all these preconceived notions, they were gone. All of that was gone. It all fell away. It disappeared. And yeah, I, and I'm going to do my best to explain things. Sometimes there aren't words for what happened, but he, first of all, he's really funny. He's hilariously funny. <laughs> he's got a great sense of humor and he's Im immensely, uh, his compassion is infinite. So we're hovering up in the air and everything else became peripheral to him. All I wanted to do was look at him. I just wanted to look in his face. That's all I wanted to do. And he showed me my life as we're up there floating. He kind of held out his hand in this three-dimensional movie of my life played from the time I was formed in my mother's womb. He formed me in my mother's womb. He was with me when I was a child talking to me. He, he had been with me and he had been with me through the entire course of my life. He had been right here, always there. And when I'm looking at my life, this wasn't Jesus pointing fingers and saying, you did this, you did that. Why did you do this? Why? He's not like that. He showed me my life and he, he was with me as I judged my life. And this wasn't about anybody else. This wasn't about, oh, we're going to get those guys who hurt you. Don't you worry. No, they weren't there. It's nothing about them. I didn't even think about them. This was about me and how I lived my life. What had I done? If I, and as I said, I was a pretty nice kid. I was a really nice kid. But if there was something I did that was hurtful, I felt it from the other person. Not only did I see myself doing it or hear myself saying it, I felt what that person felt. And I knew, I, I knew I, I don't want to do that. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm, you know, was so sorry that I had said that or, or hurt someone's feelings because I felt the pain that they felt. Um, and he, but he forgives that you, I acknowledge that I acknowledge all of those any wrongs that I did, I acknowledged. And, it, and he made it really clear that the person, he didn't specifically say it. He didn't say, quit doing drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Stop hanging out with them. He didn't say that. But I acknowledged that the person I was hurting the most my, was myself. That's who I was hurting the most. Yeah. And after our life review, my life review, he took my hand and 
just like Superman holding Lois Lane's hand in the original movie, we flew. We flew together. Um, we left the scene. We were going really fast. Uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to be honest. People always say, what did you see? I don't know. I was looking at his face. I was staring at his face. Things were going by in the background. So I saw them because if I happened to see them as they were going by his face, then I could see them. Initially, I think I saw trees, um, but we were going faster and faster and faster. I may have seen stars. I don't know. His face was all consuming for me. His face was all I wanted to look at. And he was holding my hand. We were flying so fast. We were surfing on a wave of light. Basically, we were body surfing. And I looked down because I could feel the light tickling my fingers. And it was all different colors that makes up light. And it was rolling like a wave like this under our feet. He, he had bare feet. I had bare feet. And he had a, a robe on, kind of. So I only could see his feet, his hands, and his face. Like, so I could see like this much of his hands, his feet, and his face. And he was grinning from ear to ear because this was so fun. <laughs> this was the most fun you can imagine having body surfing on a wave of light with Jesus. It was so fun. There was no tunnel. I didn't see a tunnel. I didn't go through a tunnel. But as we went faster and faster, we reached a barrier. I'm, I'm going to call it a threshold. It was like crossing a threshold. And as we crossed the threshold, all things became one thing. And I realized that that one thing was God. And just as we crossed that threshold and um, came into, we came into this light. Okay, this is so hard. The light that I saw is, this is how I will describe it, a perfect blemishless white light that took up my entire field of vision that was infinite in its scope that was living it was alive and it was love and it was god jesus took me directly into the light and the next thing i knew jesus in the light well he was in the light but i found he was in the light, but I found myself sitting on God's lap. God, the father. This is God. Yeah. God. Yeah. I was sitting on God's lap like a little kid. And he's a big God. But I was like a little kid, like a, a toddler size. And he was, and I had my arms wrapped around his chest or his stomach. And he had his arms wrapped around me. And I buried my face against him. And I was surrounded by love and acceptance and warmth and i never wanted to leave this was my father and i as i mentioned i did not see his face i really didn't look up i kind of glanced up and his face was shrouded i don't know what he looked like but all i know is he held me in his arms and i was kicking my feet like a little kid i this was my dad this was my true father and I, I, I could have, if you, you would have said, if you had said, would you like to sit here for all eternity? I would say, yes, I would sit here for all eternity and never move. So I'm sitting there. And as I said, his, he extended everywhere. He was infinite. There was no place that he didn't extend. There was no place he didn't cover, but he kind of moved me so that I lifted my head. And this is the way I'm going to describe it. It's going to be because I don't, I have no other way to describe it. It was as if infinitely far away from me, he withdrew a portion of himself. Picture a person wearing a really long robe and they withdraw a portion, pull back a portion of that robe. And when he did that, I saw grass and I was, remember, I was infinitely far away from this grass but I could see every single blade of grass, every single detail of every single blade of grass. This is vast meadow and I'm infinitely far away from it. The green was beyond belief. I could see flowers and I could see every single petal, every single vein, every single part of the flower, amazing colors. 
I could see trees. And if you picture aspen trees shaking, quaking, I could see every leaf on every tree. I could count every leaf on every tree. I could see all the veins and all the leaves on every tree. And everything was moving. When I say quaking aspens, I mean, because they were actually moving, but they weren't moving with wind. They were moving in the light of God. And uh, they were they were singing. It's something that it was probably the thing that made the biggest impact me impact on me besides Jesus and God was the grass was singing. The grass was singing the praises of God. The grass was singing Mm -hmm. and the colors were they're, they're light colors on earth, but the colors on earth are just a reflection of those colors. It's like looking through a glass darkly, as Paul says, there's there a reflection these are a pale reflection even on the most beautiful day here yeah the colors here are still a pale reflection of what they are in heaven and as i'm looking i looked a little farther and i could see i don't know how to describe it kind of this road or pathway but i couldn't quite see it but i could see people coming and they were singing they too were singing i could see them coming towards me and i'm still sitting on god's lap And as they're coming, suddenly um, Jesus was there. I am on God's lap and Jesus is right there with me. And he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I buried my face back in God's chest. And I said, no, I'm not going back. And he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I said, no, I'm not going back. (laughs) And I would not lift my head up. He took my hand and he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And this is, you do not say no to Jesus. He was very commanding in that moment. But I said, I started yelling at him. No, I'm not going back. I was yelling. I was screaming. I'm not going back. And, uh, and finally he pulled me, he literally tugged me, tugged my hand and I screamed. I, I don't want, I'm not going back. I'll feel pain. And this time there was no surfing. There was no fun times we were right above my body. And I was just laying there. I was laying there on my left side. Charlie, the ranch owner was on his knees next to me crying. And uh, my sisters were crying. And I was like, well, I was kind of like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And Jesus took, took me and he, we went underneath my body. He shoved me up from underneath my body into my body. It was like hoovered. I call it like hoovered in. It was like, right. And when I entered my body, I hit my face. I mean, picture hitting the inside of your skull. I hit my face and I was struggling inside my body because I I had a horrible panic attack. It was the most claustrophobic feeling you can imagine to be stuck in this body. And I, I was struggling within this body. The body didn't move. I was struggling within this body and Jesus was suddenly in my body with me. And the only way I can describe it is to say, he smoothed my arms into my, my arms. He smoothed my legs into my legs. He made me whole again. And, um, I, I didn't, cause I, I didn't, I couldn't have done it myself. He did it for me. And the last thing he said before he left was your life is in good hands. That's what he said. Now there are uh, other things he talked to me about while, while I was dead, but, he said, your life is in good hands. And which was hard for me to deal with for a long time. I had to come to terms with what that meant. Um, and then I managed, it was really hard. I managed to crack open one eye and I said, could barely talk. I could not remember how to talk. And I said, Charlie (laughs) and Charlie said, thank God, thank God threw me over the horse, which is not something you do, rode down to my car, threw me in the backseat of the car, put my sisters in my sister in the car, my other sister drove right past the hospital, took me home, carried me up, put me in my bed. My mother put a heating pad on my back and left me there for 24 hours. I couldn't walk and I couldn't feel anything from the waist down. And I got a third degree burn from the heating pad, but I couldn't feel it, which ended up as a big pubitus ulcer when I was in the hospital. So that's that story. I'm more than happy to describe. I'm more than happy to describe Jesus for you. I'm 
I love him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, I'm happy to tell you some of the things he told me because he, he, you know, a lot of people when they die, they come back with a commission. They feel like, like they've come back with a commission. Mm-hmm. I, I was a teenager. I didn't feel like I had come back with a commission aside from a few things that I did immediately and a few things I did later. So where would you like to go next? So I love, I love to hear you describe his face and, you know, I love people <laughs> talk about his eyes and his smile and, you know, you had something that was a little different that I hadn't heard before about his nose. So can you share that? Oh, I love his nose. His, his eyes are so radiant. His eyes are so beautiful. And he's got kind of um, a low brow, you know, an eyebrow is he's, he's, my husband has kind of a low brow. And his eyebrows weren't thick and bushy, but they, but he had very defined brow yeah, and a really big forehead. He had the most beautiful blue eyes, he had blue eyes. And that's something I didn't tell anybody till I told John Burke, because most Jewish people I know have brown eyes. Although my dad has green eyes. Yeah. But I said, if I tell people Jesus had blue eyes, they're going to think I'm crazy. But yeah, he had the most beautiful blue eyes. And um, his hair was a kind of a chestnut brown with some streaks, some lighter streaks in it as about this long, yeah. a little wavy. He, he has a long face, had a, a beard, you know, not, not a thick beard, just the kind of the scrap short beard. Um, beautiful mouth, beautiful teeth, just a gr- an, an infectious smile. He made you, made me laugh. Every time he would open his mouth, he would be making me laugh because he was so filled with joy and his nose. I loved his nose because it was not perfect. And in its imperfection, it was perfect. He had kind of, it was kind of like crooked right here, <laughs> a little crooked right there. Like in the nose, he yeah. punched him in the nose and I loved his nose. And I thought that this nose makes him more perfect. I don't know how anyone can be more perfect than perfect, but he was more perfect than perfect. He had, you know, I, it's not like I saw, um, marks from the crucifixion. I did not. I, as I said, I saw this part of his hands, maybe his robe was long. It covered his wrists. And I only saw, um, the, I saw his feet, but the, his robe was also long on the, on his feet. So he had really long toes and long slender feet, really long fingers. And uh, his hands were just beautiful. Uh, and when he's holding your hand there, there's nothing better in the world than Jesus holding your hand. He, I mean, he's just hilarious. He's, but he's hilarious, but you also don't want to tell him no yeah <laughs> if yeah jesus, if jesus tells you to do something you're going to do it and if you don't do it he's going to make you do it well and i love how you're fighting with him like you're a true teenager like, yeah I was fighting with the son of god <laughs> yeah. no i'm not going back like um no and you mentioned that he he gave you he told he shared some things with you and i don't know if all of that is stuff that you feel comfortable sharing because i think sometimes things are just for us and between us and god and some things you might feel comfortable sharing anything you well, he, say he, I, I was really clear on the fact that when I woke up, I was a different kind of Jew. Um, I knew I was still Jewish, but my world was, had been turned upside down. And I knew that Jesus was exactly, this is what I woke up with, with. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He is my Messiah. He is my anointed one. He is the Jewish anointed one. I knew that. But one of the things I learned is there is nothing wrong with dying, going to heaven, coming back and living your life, living a good life that, that God made this world for us. And I love this life. Since I came back, do I want to see Jesus and God again? Absolutely. But do I want to leave this life? No, I love this life. And now it took away my fear of death entirely. And I never had one of those nightmares of being buried alive again, but God made this world for us and we need to lead good lives on this world. We need to follow those two commandments. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And I am not perfect at that. But what I learned is even if you don't like your neighbor very much, when your neighbor's having trouble, you can help them. So um, God did tell me a few things and the different, there's something that happens when you're dead. And there are a couple of things that happen when you're dead, or at least they happen to me. One, there is no time or you have all the time in the world. Time is very different. For me, time just was immaterial. There was no time. God steps outside of time. There's no time. So I don't know how much time passed. I don't know how long I was dead. It's somewhere between three and five minutes. That's the best estimate I can give you from what my sister said. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was an eternity. I was, I was gone for an eternity. The other thing I realized that when I was dead and when I was with Jesus is I had no more questions. All those questions. Why am I here? Is there a meaning to life? Does, is God real? Is there a heaven? Those questions were gone. All my questions were answered. But if you ask me what the answers are, what kind of, if you ask me, tell me what you, all those answers, I can't give them to you because when I woke up, I couldn't remember all the answers. I just remembered that I had no more questions when I was dead. Those questions were all answered. Um, some people have asked me, did you see, have a vision of hell or anything like, no, I didn't get the full tour. And I always say, no, but Jesus didn't say, and over here we have the pit of, of fire. I didn't <laughs> get that. I didn't get the full tour. I didn't see any pearly gates. I. I don't think, you know, when I've said to people is I didn't die enough. I wasn't quite dead enough. And I almost got the feeling, and this is going to be sound a little weird, but I almost got the feeling that I was originally intended. It was originally intended that I should die and God spared me. Hmm. I, that was the feeling I got. He spared me for a reason. And it took me, it has taken me decades to figure out the reason because it's very hard to be a Jewish person who meets Jesus, a Jewish person who believes, who is, who knows Jesus is the Messiah and risk alienation from your community, from your family and from your friends. And you're not, and at least in those days, I wasn't particularly well accepted by the Christian community either. I, and it's, been hard to find a place in both worlds. Yeah. Well, I can imagine how did you even share this when you came, when you came out of this? Well, I initially, uh, it took my mom 24 hours to get me to the doctor. And that was not easy because I hauled myself down the stairs, down a, a flight of stairs on my elbows and into the car. And the doctor took one look at me and sent me to the hospital where I was in the hospital for a long time, but he, he actually didn't call in any specialists and I couldn't move. In fact, this was an understaffed hospital. So, and you're a nurse, so you yes. experience, you, you know how difficult it is. They, for the entire orthopedic floor, they had one nurse and one aide. And if I had to, she would come and put me on a bedpan or a fracture pan and leave me on it for three hours. And I couldn't, couldn't move. Um, I finally ended up, what I ended up doing was lowering my bed to the lowest position, rolling out. I knew I had to log roll. That's the only thing I knew. I knew I had to log roll and dragging myself to the bathroom, propping myself up and then throwing myself on the floor and dragging myself back. So it's a miracle that I can walk, but we can talk about that in a sec. So yeah. the second day, my parents came the second evening I was in the hospital. I was pretty shocky for a while. And I remember my mom sitting at my bedside, my dad standing next to her. And I said, I died. I saw Jesus and he took me to heaven. And my mother said, oh, honey, you just imagine that. And I said, no, I died. I saw Jesus and I went to heaven with him. And my dad went, he, he turned deathly pale and walked out of the room. The next thing I knew the next night I had a, an, a rabbi coming and, and at the time my parents had switched to a reform temple, reform Judaism temple. And the rabbis, as my father says, he's a brilliant man. Well, he was a brilliant man. He's also an atheist. 
And he came and he listened to my story and he said, we imagine a lot of things when we're unconscious. There is no God. And I said, I didn't imagine this. I died. I saw Jesus and he took me to heaven. And there was no, obviously not going to convince me otherwise. It's not going to happen. So he left. And then my parents sent in a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist was Catholic actually. And he didn't try to convince me otherwise. He just didn't want to talk about it. He, he talked to me about his kids uh, we talked about a lot of things, but, but he did not want to talk about this. So it's, it was very difficult. And I, what I found in the, in the aftermath of meeting Jesus and knowing what he expected of me before I left the hospital, I broke up with my boyfriend. I stopped hanging out with all the kids I was hanging out with. I never used drugs again. I don't drink anyway, stopped smoking cigarettes and I kept my head down. I finished school in a year. So I, I graduated from school a year early because the one I did not argue with my parents anymore. There was no point I'm not going to do that anymore. And the one thing I knew was I was going to Israel because I was going to be, I wanted to be close to Jesus again. So when I was 17, I went to Israel. And I had a dual reason for going. First of all, I'm Jewish and I, I wanted to go. But more importantly, I wanted to see where he had lived. I wanted to, to walk where he had walked. I wanted to see all the places in the Bible. And at this point, I hadn't even read the New Testament. I didn't even know where I was going for sure. I just knew Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, uh, Jerusalem. Bethlehem, I just had to see these places and Garden of Gethsemane, I did know about that. And I ended up spending the night there one night, I just stayed there an entire night. I had to go to these places. And I felt when I was there, first of all, I got much stronger emotionally. But I was felt I, I felt like I was walking on the bones of history, which you are when you're in Israel, you're walking on the bones of history, you're walking where the patriarchs walk, walked, you're walking where the Hebrew Bible was written, you're walking on the bones of history, and you're kicking history, there are all kinds of pottery shards from the time of David, or even before that you're just kicking around as you walk. So um, I lived on a kibbutz at the foot of Mount Gilboa, where King, I believe King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed or slain. And uh, it was about 40 minutes south of Nazareth and near the sea, about an hour from the Sea of Galilee. So I spent a lot of time up there. I learned Hebrew. I already knew some Hebrew, but I became fluent in Hebrew and, and I uh, worked on an archeological excavation for a while. I lived there for a little over a year. And yes, it changed me, but then Jesus made the biggest change in me. And I will say, it, I didn't, I wasn't um, compelled to join a church. Neither was I compelled to return to the synagogue. I had been to a church one time when I was a little kid. I was six or seven years old and I spent the night with a friend and we went to church on Easter morning. I went to church with her. And I remember the pastor preaching the, about the, the Jews were Christ killers. And I was so scared. I didn't know what a Christ killer was because I didn't know what Christ was. <laughs> but I was so scared. Everyone would find out I was Jewish and kill me. And it was hard for me to go back to a church because I didn't, because in truth, I am still Jewish, but I am a Jewish follower of Jesus. And no, I'm not a messianic Jew. I don't go to a messianic temple or anything like that. I, I go to, I attend, um, I do both. John Burke gave me permission <laughs> yeah. to be Jewish, which I struggled with for years. I attend an Orthodox synagogue here, which is ultra Orthodox. And I love it because it's what I grew up with. I'm very comfortable with that. But I also go to an evangelical church every Sunday. I love all the pastors. I love the teaching. I love the music and I love Jesus. So I do both. What I love what and you said, you said that you came back, not being more religious, but more in love with Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had always been there. I realized he had always been there and none of the bad stuff that had happened. That wasn't God's fault. He hadn't done that. He hadn't caused anyone to do that. People have free will. 
People have a choice. And as I said, when we had my life review, he didn't sit there as an avenging angel saying, I'm going to get those guys for you. Don't worry, I'll punish them. This was not about them. This wasn't about anything bad someone had done to me. This was about me and how did I behave and how did I treat other people and how did I love other people? That was what it was about. It's really nice to talk to you because I feel like I can totally open up about all of this. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's so interesting. I know um, a lot of the things that you're saying are actually biblical. And, you know, I think it's so interesting when people have these experiences and they come back and, you know, me not having had one, I just think I would get there and I'm like, okay, Jesus, tell me all these, what's Paul Thorne? What's, you know, all these questions, all these, you know, and I would, but you, everyone says they get there and they, they know who Jesus is and they, they know their home. And, and in the Bible, I knew you before you were ever born. Like that is really our true home. And when they come back, it's like, they just know, and they don't, you know, it's not, I mean, not that people haven't asked questions, you know, but even, yeah. you know, there's so many pieces like, um, and I was so, I was so glad that I got to hear your interview with John first, because I am a little bit, when people say they see God, the father, you know, of course we talked about this in the Bible, you know, it says that you can't, no man can see his face. And, um, but when you said to John that you sat in his lap, like he said, you know, I didn't put that in the book, but I've heard, you know, I've heard <laughs> this and it was like, okay. So, cause that was one of my questions I wanted to ask him, like, does anyone see God, the father? Um, and then some of the pieces that you talked about, like, you know, the vision, the vision, I think John touched on that in our interview. There's actually a verse where John is lifted up and he's able to see, like, that's actually biblical that your mm-hmm. their senses are different. Um, another thing, you know, when you talked about how the trees were praising God and, um, the, the, the light, everyone talks about the light, how it's mm-hmm. alive and it's praise. Everything is praising God. And in the Bible, you know, even the rocks will cry out, like yes. <laughs> it just all ties together. And, um, I think at one point you had shared too, that one of the things he told you was I am the way, the truth and the life. And that's right out of the Bible, you know? And, um, I just, I think it's, it's really amazing. Um, you know, and I know that I don't know everything about the Jewish faith either, but, um, obviously, you know, Jesus was a Jew and I Mm -hmm. don't know how all these, I don't know how it's all going to work out when he comes back. And, you know, I feel like even doing this podcast, you know, it's, my goal is for people to see Jesus for be, to be led to his, to him and to his word. And, and they have to be convicted by the Holy spirit and what, what they do with their faith. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's beautiful what happened to you. And I want to know, um, we are going to have another episode with Heidi because she was a hospice nurse and she has an amazing testimony as a hospice nurse. So that's going to, I'm going to go take a whole hour to go into that with her. It's going to be great. Um, I guess if there's one more thing I could ask you, um, you know, if having the life review, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm glad I, I think about that sometimes here. And I actually, um, reached out to someone from high school and apologized for something I did because mm-hmm. she didn't even remember it, but it's like, you know, I don't want to have regrets and, I, I want to know that, you know, um, it, it gives me comfort that he's not standing there, you know, and you're just feeling condemned. Of course, we know there's no condemnation for those in Christ, but um, it, it's good to, to see that it's not that way that you didn't feel shame or, but it, but it taught you something. So coming back, you know, if you could talk to people that obviously haven't had this experience about, and maybe they have a lot of hardships in their life, maybe, um, you know, they're, there are things they would do differently. Like you talked about how, when you could feel how other people feel with, Mm -hmm. in relation to your actions, like what kind of message would you have for, for listeners? Well, I would say, and it's, it's complicated because nobody likes to tell anybody else what to do, but I will say that Jesus is love. He loves all of us, even when we do bad things, because I am not perfect. And as I've said to other people, Jesus will open a door for me and I will walk right into the wall. I don't always follow exactly what he's telling me to do, but I'm aware of it. I make, I keep it. I, he is always in my mind and he's always in my heart that when I'm about to do something, I think, okay, how would he expect me to behave? What does he expect of me? And I try, I try to keep that in mind in terms of my behavior towards other people. It's not that I try to be better than them. It's that I try to, because I don't, I'm no better than anyone else. We are all flawed human beings, but I try to keep in mind that 
love is stronger than hate, that uh, God, my sister and I actually had this discussion recently. If Hitler was drowning and you saw it, would you save him? And I said, I hate to tell you this, but I would. And I know that's a terrible thing, but life, God gave us life and we need to, we need to value this life. He gave us the ability to love. And he also, it's judgment is his, you know, there, for, for example, I know the difference between right and wrong and there is right and there is wrong. And when you die, whether you have done good or whether you have done evil, you will face the truth. And that's what Jesus made clear to me. You will face the truth. So keep, I always keep that in mind. I wish I could be more, I wish I could express this in a better way. I'm not perfect and I don't strive for perfection because I know Jesus doesn't expect that of me. What he expects of me is to be a good person, to be a loving person and to raise my children in, in the way he would want me to raise them in the way he wants me to raise them, to be loving, kind, compassionate, understanding, God-fearing people. And I have three amazing kids so I'm, and two incredible grandkids. So I love that. He's gifted me with that. He gifted me with the miracle of healing because believe me, I shouldn't be able to walk right now. Yeah. Um, and he gifted me with another a chance at life. And in later years, now that my kids are grown, he's gifted me with the time to provide this kind of testimony. And this is really hard because the people I want to reach, reach out to the most, I want to reach out to everybody, but I'd love to reach out to Jewish people and they're the hardest to reach. I'll be honest with you. And I love the Jewish people. And I believe God loves the Jewish people. He uh, made a covenant with us and he, God does not forget his promises. He keeps his promises. So, you know, the thing, the one thing I can tell your viewers is I have known since I met Jesus, that God has a plan. The plan is unfolding. We are living in history. We are living in God's history. And the plan is unfolding. How it will end, I don't know. When it will end, I don't know. But I know we are all part of his plan. Um, if I can meet Jesus, and <laughs> coming from the background I came from, he's there for every single one of us. And I know that. I know. And I know, without a doubt, he's there for every single one of us no matter what we're going through. Beautiful, beautiful. And how are you, um, how is your relationship with your family now? That I'm very close to my youngest sister. Um, my middle sister and I are not as close, but then we never really where she has, you know, middle sisters have issues. She is, um, my youngest sister and I talk about God all the time. She is Jewish but she studies about Jesus. My um, parents, my, my mom actually has read my book and she loves, she has dementia now, but she did read my book and she has talked to me about my near death experience. And she believes very strongly in, in God now. Um, she can't, she's not going to talk about Jesus because of my dad, who's still an atheist. And he has not only not read my book, he won't, will not discuss my experience and he won't discuss my death. My cousins, I love my cousins. This isn't something I'm going to talk about with them unless they bring it up. If they bring it up, yep, I'm going to talk about, it. I'm going to be very, if, if anyone asks me about it, I'm very honest, but I don't force my views on anyone. That's yeah. not my job. Yeah. But um, anyone who knows that I died, I am absolutely upfront with what happened and what I believe yeah. and who my savior is. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and my husband, my husband's Jewish too. And we have a lot of really interesting discussions. Uh, he was raised in a, in a secular family, secular Jewish family. So he had really very little introduction to religion at all. But he and I have a, a wonderful relationship. God brought us together. And that's another story in itself. And uh, he's become much more Jewish. We do keep kosher in our home. 
Mm -hmm. And I figure first Jewish, then Jesus. Those are the steps we take. And I will, you know, God brought us together for a reason. I've, I've known him since I was 14 and he was 16. Yeah. There. And, yeah. And you can keep praying, you know, God is sovereign over hearts. And I pray all the time, you know, God soften their heart, help them. Mm-hmm. You know, he did that in the yeah. Bible. He hardened hearts. He softened hearts, softened hearts. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, he does. And I'm sure he leads you when you should share. And, um, you know, I, I just keep praying. So I'll, I'll actually tell you, I'll yeah. tell you a really funny story. Yeah. God doesn't always want me to share. I remember in college, there was a super cute boy who I worked with. We were working at a co-op. And I just thought, he's so cute. And he doesn't talk to me. I, I Maybe if I tell him about that I died, he'll talk to me. And I remember starting to open my mouth and go, ah! and it was as if God shoved his hand over my mouth and I could hear him say, no, we don't use this experience for personal gain. <laughs> so... Wow. It's just like, okay, not doing it. So I, you know, this is not something you use for personal gain. It's just not, it is to spread God's love. Mm. Just thought that was so funny that he did that. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That's really cool. Well, this has been so amazing, Heidi. And I just, I thank you for sharing and it's, you know, it's gotta be it's a big deal for you to come out and share this from, from your background. And thank you. This has been great. I really, I'm just very honored that you would trust me to, to share this today. And I know the the listeners are thrilled to hear. So, um, can you share a little bit about, um, just a teaser for our next episode? Um, do you want to talk about your book a little bit or I wrote a hospice book. I wrote it back in 2007. And I believe it was published in 2009, maybe with the publisher took me, I marketed this book for two years before I could find a publisher. And a lot of people said, oh, it's a great book. I I want, I, I might be interested in that book, but I never heard back. I did finally find a publisher. And, um, I always tell people this is about my hospice experience, the growth I experienced as a hospice nurse, because it was never really my intention to go into nursing in the first place, which miracle I ended up in nursing. Um, yeah, <laughs> there was a higher power there. And uh, I, so I kept coming home and telling my husband these remarkable stories. I left out the names obviously because of privacy, but I told my husband these remarkable experiences I had as a hospice nurse. And it was so emotional for me. And he said, write it down. My first degree is in creative writing. So I did, I started writing And uh, I ended up finding a publisher. I do mention my near-death experience and my publisher at the time, publisher and editor took out all most references to Jesus and really trimmed down the near-death experience because they felt this is a hospice book. Hospice is for everyone. Whatever you want to share privately is up to you, but we're taking it out of the book. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand that once you give up your rights to a book, they get to do what they want. They could have changed everything if they wanted to. So I did get the book back and uh, edited a little bit of it, but I uh, do plan to write a book specifically about my near-death experience in God. So that's coming. The hospice book, I leave as it is. It's, I leave as it is because I respect those, those patients who, who are the centers of those stories so much. I just want to leave it as it is. It's, you know, and I think, I don't know if I mentioned in the book, but one of the hardest things about hospice for, for me as a hospice nurse was reaching Jewish people. Jewish people are, because a lot of modern Jews are atheists which is sad and your listeners may or may not understand this Um, in their minds, even if someone is in absolute misery, it's better than death. And it's hard to get Jewish people to sign on to hospice hospice people. We all die. It's people are going to die. And as I say, as I've often said, sometimes the answer to your prayers is death. That is God's gift. We all die. Just is it's a matter of when and how. 
And um, sometimes that is God's answer. Suffering is, is he takes, he removes that suffering. And I know what people are going to. So I'm not afraid for them. And that's kind of what the book is about. And I did have, I had some really tough cases, but I had some really amazing cases, really yes. amazing patients. I read and the book. changed it's, me. It's good. Yeah. It's really good. I cried and I, I cracked up and I was a little burst <laughs> out in a few of the stories. <laughs> and even as that's, a nurse. <laughs> yeah. My sister said that she said, you laugh, you cry, you feel sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, and it took me back because I had a rotation, you know, in all these, some of these different areas. So it took me back, but it's really good. It's really, really good. And I'm looking forward to doing that interview with you. It's going to bless a lot of people. So Heidi, this has been amazing. Um, I want to ask you, you know, a lot of people that have these experiences, they come back and they may have a message uh, to give to people. They may have a new calling. They may want to go into ministry or they may just have some new insights. So um, anything that you want to say to the listeners along those lines or, or any parting messages that you want to give, I'd love to hear. You know, I've met people who've come back from these experiences. I haven't met a lot of people, but I have met people who've come back and they do go into the ministry. And I even met one man, a uh, gentleman that John Burke introduced me to, who had a hellish NDE and he came back and became a pastor. And um, I didn't feel that calling, but I did learn some things. I felt that the most important thing to God was A, that I come back and have kids, have children, and B, raise them, do not raise them the way I was raised, raise them with God's love, raise them with hope, raise them with heaven, raise them with God in mind and God in their heart. And that was really my calling. And I always knew I would have children and, and that they would be raised differently than I was raised. And I learned, I learned a couple things. I learned one, most importantly, God loves children. And I, I learned when I was there in heaven, kids get to bypass all the bad stuff. Kids get go straight to God. They just go straight to God. And I learned that they don't, it's like, do not pass, go, do not collect <laughs> whatever you just get to go. Um, straight into God's arms. And you get to take one thing with you. If, if you saw the, if you remember the old Billy Crystal movie where he went to a cow, dude ranch and learned how to be a cowboy yes. and Curly said one thing. one thing, if there's one thing you get to take with you, it's love. That is the only thing you get to take with you. You don't get to take money. You don't get to take prestige. You don't get to take power. You don't get to take any of those things. No, nothing, none of that matters. You get to take the love you feel for others and the love they feel for you. That's it. That's all you get to bring with you in your little suitcase when you go to heaven. <laughs> so if I could share that, I think that's God's most important message is love. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Heidi. This Welcome. is amazing. <laughs> so amazing. It's great. It's good yeah. to talk to you. Oh, you too. And if I could just pray us out really quick um, and just, just thank God for this. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up um, dear That's heavenly good. father. I just thank you for Heidi and my sister. And I thank you for um, this amazing testimony, but Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're always with us. Um, I thank you that um, you have prepared a place for us, Lord, and it is, is very real. And we're all so excited to be there one day all together. Um, but Lord, give us the strength and give us the wisdom and give us, um, give us what we need to do what you want us to do here on earth, Lord, before we make that journey. Um, and Lord, we just praise you for who you are. We love you. And uh, we ask that you take this testimony to people that need to hear it, Lord. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for listening today. Uh, just totally amazing. And remember, we have another episode with Heidi where we're going to talk about her amazing experiences as, as a hospice nurse. And it sounds weird, but um, death is a part of life and it can actually be very mm -hmm. beautiful. So she has a lot to share and I, I know you're going to love it and be blessed. So if you have a miracle you'd like to share with me, please reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast.com or you can email me directly everydaymiraclespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much and God bless.